Welcome to this Travel Weekly webcast. I'm Ian Taylor and I'm joined today by Clive Jacobs, chairman of Jacobs Media Group, the parent company of Travel Weekly. Welcome, Clive. Nice to see you, Ian. Thank you. Uh, good to see you. Um, we're speaking in advance of the Prime Minister uh, making his an announcement on February the 22nd. What, um, what do you hope to hear from him? What do I hope to hear from the Prime Minister? Well, first, first I'll tell you that I've given up hoping about things uh, because uh, I think we've, we've all hoped for a lot of things um, throughout this pandemic, not least that the pandemic goes away and we can get back to normal. But when you talk about hope from politicians, um, you, you've, you've, gone in, you've gone in straight away there, Ian, because you know that I'm very, very, um, I'm very upset with our politicians because of the way that they uh, have handled this. Um, I, and I must say, of course, it goes without saying that the vaccination program has been a huge success. Uh, but um, <clears throat> that's largely been because it was uh, the vaccines were uh, bought and brought and administered by uh, someone from the private sector who um, is an incredibly successful uh, businesswoman. And the logistics of rollout, which is nearly almost forgotten now, has been handled by our military, uh, by Brigadier Prosser. And um, that's just about probably the only great thing that this government have, have done. What Boris is inclined to do is either overpromise and underdeliver, which has been their mistake probably largely, um, certainly on the lead up to Christmas, where, they've, where they did an enormous amount of harm to businesses. And, and now he's gone completely the other way. So he's flip-flopped from, from that sort of situation to a situation where now, um, when the rest of the world is looking at, um, at, at opening up, trying to be quite positive about the way the pandemic is, is hopefully coming to its natural uh, conclusion in terms of the cycle of a pandemic, pandemic in, in, in the fact that vaccine is being rolled out. Uh, and you hear Biden talk about, we'll be back to normal by Christmas. You hear, you hear uh, Fauci uh, talk about we'll be back to normal by Christmas uh, in the United States. And here, uh, a week ago, we administered uh, quarantine hotels for a number of countries that have become red list countries purely as a cosmetic exercise to try and make people feel that the government is, is actually doing something. And then it becomes highly politicised because Nicola Sturgeon wants to prove that she's more of a man than Boris Johnson. So she creates a quarantine for all. And so you say hope. I mean, I, what, what, what I hope is that one day this country gets some decent politicians that could actually <laughs> lead it through, through a crisis. That's what I hope for, Ian, I'm afraid. Because, okay. but that, no, no, I mean, I, I've, I've just got to say it because, you know, if this was a bigger crisis, if this was MERS, which was killing 25 to 30 percent of the people that actually contracted the virus, um, you do worry about the way that, 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 that the government are dealing with things. And, and therefore, I know you want me to say something hopeful that he'll say, but at the moment, I can't be hopeful because I'm basing my judgment on his performance over the last um, 12 months or 11 months. OK, but, but probably we're not going to see a wholesale change of politicians on, on Monday. So um, the Prime Minister's talked about basing decisions on data, not dates. That's sensible, surely. Finally, yes. But that was my point. The Prime Minister was basing stuff on dates. Now he's realised that, of course, you base your judgments on data. And whilst talking about data, you've got to balance up the data, Ian, which is the data of the suffering of people, both financially and health-wise, from the effects of lockdowns and botched communications and constant propaganda of fear versus coronavirus. So again, you, you, you're, back, you're back to the same, to the same point. Um, he's, he's come round 11 months too late 
to recognize that you've got to use data. But that data has got to be not just data around COVID, it's got to be data around the damage that is being done to our economy. The damage that is being done to the future of children and generations to come. The damage that is being done to people's health. How many people are dying from heart attacks at the moment, from stress? How many people are committing suicide? How many people's businesses have folded? So the data needs to be all data. And what they need to learn to do, which they won't, is learn to balance and manage risk and not just listen to scientists who have one specific job. So, okay, okay. Look, I, I think we can agree and probably every, almost everyone would agree that the government's made all kinds of uh, mistakes. Although, of course, the other governments are criticised uh, in some cases more than the UK, for example, over the vac vaccination rollout in Europe and so on. But um, uh, Boris has said this lockdown has to be the last. And that surely is, is right, isn't it? So what would be the bigger mistake now? To go too fast or to go not fast enough? Okay, so firstly, just to come back in what you said about Europe and other governments, two wrongs don't make a right. Um, very old fashioned saying, but I'm sorry, I, st I still will not concede. We deserve better, stronger and more concise leadership. But to, to, your, to your point there, um, of course, um, the way that you come out of lockdown um, is, has got to be managed very carefully. Um, we can't afford to go back into another lockdown. That, that I think everyone recognises. But then, you know, you've got people like myself, and I'll put my head above the parapet. I've been saying for some time that we've got to learn to live with this virus. So whilst... Um, no one would encourage any recklessness, and particularly now, uh, after previous mistakes that have been made, um, it should be a mixture of analysing all data and then recognising, um, for example, as, as you and I both know, because you're dealing with this day in, day out, as I am, but in a different way, that the transmission through hospitality and travel of this virus is very, very tiny indeed. Very tiny. The main transmission of this virus has been in hospitals, about half of it, or care homes, or in communities where people are living in very, very, very um, confined spaces. Um, hospitality and travel has taken extreme measures to try and give confidence to the public that it really is a low transmission area. So in answering your question, I believe that yes, uh, we shouldn't put ourselves in jeopardy of another lockdown, but equally, we shouldn't keep beating up travel and hospitality as um, plague spreaders. They're not. The, the, the spread of this virus has been largely in the NHS in hospitals. And again, the argument is not sufficiently balanced. So now you have a public where 78% in a YouGov poll yesterday or today said that we should have a, a complete quarantine, quarantine hotel policy because the, the public have been bamboozled and, and made afraid by um, mixed messages or uh, ill thought through messages from people like Grant Chaps who should know better and others that sort of are saying that you shouldn't go on holidays. And now today in the papers, they're saying, actually there might be holidays. People are confused, they're afraid. And so, again, I think uh, the problem you've got here is that there's too much politics at play, there's too much optics at play, and there's not enough data-driven and reality, because if it was, hospitality and travel would be open now. Okay, but the, j just on the point of, of data, the, the government and the scientists around the government, advising the government, have said pretty consistently now um, that we will have to live with the virus and they expect it to become something like the flu with regular vaccination and so on. But for the time being, they have to keep an eye on the variant. So they're looking at that data and we know that they want to open the schools by March the 8th and then look at the, the impact of opening the schools for two or three, after two or three weeks and see what stage they take 
next, but they will have a framework for progressively opening things through the next few months. So what you're, what you're suggesting looks like pretty much as though it is going to happen at a rate we don't know quite know yet because there are still un, uncertainties. Um, obviously you're critical of the government and there's lots of reasons to be. What criticisms, if any, would you say uh, are justified of the industry or industry groups in the way they've responded to, to the crisis? Okay, Ian, I, I just want you to know, and you know me quite well, of course, I'm not being critical of the government because I'm one of these people that moan or just criticise for the sake of it. I'm criticising the government because, unfortunately, in democracies, the, what, government, what, the, what governments do is more, more geared around optics and pleasing the newspapers and ple pleasing the masses, which are influenced by the newspapers, than actually doing what's right. So they're often unable to do what's right. And I just want to make that point. So I don't criticise just for the hell of it. Yeah, yeah, I get that. But it's, it's quite difficult to, to please people during a pandemic, isn't it? Well, it, it is if you, if you keep flip-flopping and changing the way that you approach it. But coming, coming back to the industry, coming back to the industry, um, again, you know, I'm going to appear critical, but not, not, not for the sake of it. First of all, I'm going to heap a bit of praise, and that's on the hospitality industry. Um, UK Hospitality, which is led by Kate Nichols, uh, has had one pillar of leadership uh, in, in Kate Nichols and her organisation, and has had one message, seat at the table. And because, as I've often said in my entire business career, if you keep things simple, if, if the messages are small and simple, if you are operating cohesively and undividedly, then you, make, uh, you, you do get uh, um, success and you do achieve things. And UK hospitality has been um, way more successful at lobbying government than the travel industry. And as you, know, as you may be aware, um, the petition um, for a minister for hospitality was heard because there were 200,000 odd signatures the industry rallied behind getting the signatures and, and have consistently used Kate as, as the mouthpiece of the industry so that there aren't mixed messages and mixed signals. And it has driven more success. I won't say it's been completely successful because politicians um, choose to listen to what suits them a lot of the time, but they have had a single voice from hospitality. Travel, on the other hand, unfortunately, does not talk with one voice. Travel talks with multiple voices, multiple campaigns. And whilst I could never criticise uh, people for, for trying to do good and, and, and their, 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 their intentions are very, very genuine and they're trying their best and, 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 and a, lot of, a lot are born out of frustration and, and, and seeing the damage that is being done. Uh, unfortunately, because of that lack of joining together under one voice and one slogan, and uh, the, the travel industry is, is being completely ignored. It's being dismissed. It's, its concerns are not being heard. There's no uh, sector specific support. And there is broadly a lack of understanding of what our industry is about. And then that, that's caused largely because you've got outbound, as I've said previously, fighting inbound. When the truth is, they keep talking about holidays to, to, to the government, again, keep talking about holidays. Holidays broadly, if you take the mix of inbound and outbound to the UK, make up 50% of travel. That means there's another 50%. And of that other 50%, 30% is friends and family. It's, it's visiting relatives. The world has changed since the Second World War. People are mobile. People have got families all over the world. People are constantly, there are huge communities in this country of people from all over the world. And people are being deprived, deprived the um, opportunity to, to be with their relatives. You know, they've got people that are sick, people that are getting married, people that sadly have passed away. And the government just constantly bangs on and the media just constantly bang on about holidays. It's not just holidays. And of course, our planes that are carrying 
these people on holiday and, and visiting relations and on business and traveling around the world competing on sports and other activities are also carrying the bulk of the cargo that comes into this country as well. The messaging is appalling from our industry because the industry is, is fighting its own corners. So it dilutes, constantly dilutes its messages. And people sadly like Grant Shapps that has got no understanding of the industry. Richie Sunak, who doesn't have an understanding of, of, of business at a micro level and various other ministers, it just all goes over their head. And we are no further forward in, in, in government really understanding what's going on. So without trying to be critical, but trying to be constructive, as I've been saying for 25 years, if the industry spoke with one voice, it would get much further. But unfortunately, it's got too many agendas. There's too many egos, which come with all these associations. And as a result, we're getting nowhere. And this will not change until people actually operate under one voice, as I've described with, with the success that UK hospitality has had under Kate Nichols. Yeah, so the, so the, the merger of two organisations to form UK hospitality not long before the pandemic was, was um, uh, well, advantageous to, uh, at the very least. I'll, I'll excuse the pun there, but um, Ian, but, but yes, it, it, it was, but I still feel, and you know that I'm, I'm involved in both industries. I still feel that hospitality is just, is, is simply more united. Um, travel is very disparate. Uh, you've got inbound, you've got out, outbound, you've got hotels, you've got airlines, you've got tour operators, you've got travel agents, you've got home working travel agents. You've got so many different elements. You've got the World Travel and Tourism Council and you've got lots of local um, and regional uh, um, associations and, and unfortunately as a result the messaging is getting terribly diluted and um, I don't think you know as I said in my last interview with you some time back I just I just wish the industry would learn lessons um, you know the, the first thing the industry needs to do is get everybody around the table uh, socially distanced of course and um, get everyone around the table and try and agree what are the pillars, what are the planks of what we're trying to communicate to government and have one voice, one spokesperson that, 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 is, is, that is consistent in that messaging. It's the only way this will work. On this pandemic, we're too late, but um, this won't be the last pandemic as we know. And, okay. um, and, the, and we've got to learn from this. Um, I, 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 like I say, I've been banging on about this, Ian, and I'm banging on now about it, but nobody will listen because unfortunately people just are driven by their own agendas. Okay. I mean, there are a competing interests in the, in the industry of, uh, of course, and it would be more straightforward to unite the hospitality sector in a single country than, uh, you know, the inbound, outbound, and all the rest of it. But I wanted to put something specific to you about the situation now. So I received this email uh, from somebody fairly senior in the industry who's speaking to government, um, referring to the demand we've seen in the last few days, week or so, for a restart of travel on May the 1st, or by May the 1st. And the email said this, I cannot overstate how, how unhelpful this is. We're spending a huge amount of time with government talking about the need for a risk-based approach to opening when it's safe to do so. Demanding a reopening by May the 1st make, makes the sector look like we only care about ourselves and not public health. We're one sector out of many and the government's grappling with a health crisis. We have to work with the government, not against it. This blows a lot of work out of the water. Does that worry you? Uh, by the way, I couldn't agree with that sentiment more. Uh, the only word I didn't like that you used was risk because the word I like to use is you have to balance risk mm -hmm. and weigh up risk, is, which is something we do in business every day. 
and which governments um, uh, need to do more, particularly in this pan uh, pandemic. There needs to be, as I said earlier, I don't want to repeat myself, but I totally agree with that sentiment. You can't just do this on a date. You have to do this based on, on weighing up all the information, but not just listening to scientists, okay? Uh, we know uh, that, and I've, I, I've been traveling quite a bit on business in, in the last um, few months, as you know, Ian. We know that the cabin air in, in, in aircraft now is being, is being completely replenished every three minutes or, or less. Uh, we, we know that um, planes are being boarded from, from the back to the front. We know that, that, that there is a lot of work that's been done to make travel much, much safer. Um, we're not getting across those points in the way that the scientists, whose job it is to be scientists, and, you know, science isn't, an, isn't exact, so they come out with lots of, of different what ifs uh, and they do a lot of fear mongering and scaring and that's fine, but it's not balanced. So the balance is the industry talking about all the measures it's taken to mitigate the risks. But I totally agree that, that that's what I mean about people talking in, in too many directions it, is that it, it is that, you know, to me to, to, to come out of this on, by, on a date is, is, is foolish. You come out of this when all the factors are right and everything can work well and handle what you're trying to achieve, as proven with the quarantine hotels, for example. You know, I, I flew into the country um, before, before the quarantine hotels. Um, I, I want to tell you, because I want to tell the industry this, I want to tell everyone this. This is an example of what I'm trying to say. So I flew into Heathrow, I believe I flew into Heathrow on the 31st of January. Um, the border force situation was such that because a, a week earlier that there were queues of three or four hours and people were, it was getting into the newspapers. So under pressure, they decided to just rush people through. They weren't checking documentation properly and most people were putting through the e-gates. So when I saw the queue initially, I thought, oh my God, I'm gonna be here for five hours. I was there for 15 minutes because again, as I keep trying to say, everything is being done because the papers are driving the agenda and it's all about optics. So going back to your point, they rushed through this hotel quarantine on 34 countries where there's no balance or rhyme or reason because there's another 60 countries have got, that have got all these variants that aren't on that red list. They can't manage it properly, but they, they committed to a date. They didn't even have the inventory tied up. So I rest my case. Of course, you can't operate to dates. And that's why, again, Ian, I know you're being sort of defensive about the government. Oh, um, please, don't, don't accuse me of that. But, but I'm sorry. You know, it's the motives. It's what's driving. It's, it's, it's what's driving the way they do things. And that's why, you know, I'm, I'm maybe more vociferous than most people because, frankly, I'm fed up with it. There needs to be more honesty about what is really going on. There needs to be more honesty about the way the government are reacting and why they're reacting. And yes, the industry needs to stop shooting itself in the foot continually because we really are just seen as a, as a business that is frivolous. It's all about people going on holiday and you've got a public that now saying shut down. It's only holidays. They forget how many people's lives and livelihoods depend on our industry and how much GDP this country actually depends on from in and outbound travel and tourism because they're not being informed correctly. All they're being informed about is scare stories from scientists. Okay, the, the, um, as a journalist, I like the idea of the uh, newspapers having the kind of influence you, you suggest. I, I suspect that nowadays, if you look at the circulation of the, the papers, it's highly unlikely. They certainly don't have the influence they, they, they used to have, but, but your, the polls definitely bear out what you're you're, you're saying there's overwhelming support for border controls, uh, hotel quarantine, or all, all the rest of it. Um, ob you're obviously right about the, you know, it being safe to fly, the uh, incidence of transmission in flight is minimal. 
of, and of course that's that's absolutely correct but you yourself said a year just a, almost a year ago Clive if measures had been in place more quickly we may have been able to stop this but airlines kept flying uh, our industry is shown to have been a spreader of the virus um, so you know it's the, the the virus did spread spread around the world through flying and it's understandable that there should be caution about having open borders when there's such a, a high rate of prevalence of the virus all around the world particularly when there's an effort like the vaccination program that appears capable of getting the virus under control here so surely i mean new zealand for example has kept its borders closed but its domestic economy is open i'm not saying that's what i would support but it that's an example isn't it well i'm pleased you brought up new zealand and australia because i've got to be honest with you Ian. i'm deeply concerned for those two countries um as you say their dom domestic economies uh, are, are broadly okay um but um you tell me how they're going to unlock um, uh, um, and when. Um, I'm not a scientist and I'm not an expert on anything, but I, I am known for using common sense and common sense would suggest that there is no herd immunity whatsoever in those populations. Uh, we know there's 25 to 30 percent herd immunity in Europe and the UK and the United States. You've, you've now got um, in this country, more or less the same amount of people that, that are vaccinated as well. Uh, Australia and New Zealand will have to vaccinate um, their entire populations, um, entire populations, before they open back up to the world. Otherwise, they run the risk of, of, of a health catastrophe. So, and, and I just want to go back to the point you made that I commented on things at the beginning of this pandemic. I did. And... Um, just like today, I could be getting things wrong today that I'm saying today, when we look back in, in 10 or 11 months time on what I've said today, N not about governments, by the way, but, uh, but on other points, it's possible that I may well have got things wrong. Um, hindsight is priceless. But, but my point that I was trying to make about the industry is, again, if the industry was more cohesive, it would have said, Let, let's, let's, you know, like with the ash crowd, let's ground now. Let's try and let's try and you know stop the spread as much as possible now. And there was some kind of collectiveness um, because I don't want the industry to be labelled as a spreader of of disease and virus. And and the reality is because the way we currently move from country to country is uh, predominantly on on aircraft. Um, we've got to show a level of responsibility. It, it's too late with this pandemic. So now all this quarantine hotel um, nonsense, and it is nonsense, um, it's too late. You know, there's variants all around the world. There's going to be variants for ever and a day. The virus is endemic and shutting borders now is, is, is shutting uh, the door, um, the stable door after the horse is bolted. So, uh, but, but, um, at the beginning, you know, we're going to have to have systems in place um, where, of course, the Chinese didn't tell anyone about the pandemic for some considerable time. And, when, and we're still none the wiser on that, despite the WHO being out there for a month. But I think we all know um, that the virus was around for a good few months before the Chinese um, decided to let anyone know. So, of course, if you have a situation like that, we can't help as an industry. But... If, if it's a country that, that is honest and cares about uh, the whole planet and everyone on it, um, then, then that will make a difference because they, they could alert people. And of course, shutting down the movement at that early stage may have made us able to control the pandemic in a better way. But hindsight is a wonderful thing, Ian. Okay. I, I, I want to come on to what support the industry needs from the government. Uh, travel and hospitality but but just on that point about hotel quarantine and it being too late and and so on i mean the my understanding is hotel quarantine as was introduced initially to last until march the 31st so it's time limited 
it may be extended into a in April. I, I assume it will be extended into April. But the point about it, and I hate being put in the position of defending a Conservative government, but but it, the point about it is, while they gather data on whether the vaccines are effective against the variants, particularly the South African variant, which is the one causing the most uh, concern. So imposing restrictions in a time limited way while you gather the data to be able to be able to relax them with confidence and not compromise the vaccination program that will allow a, a reopening domestically and internationally is surely not wholly stupid. We're going to have to disagree in okay. um, because you, you just said it. If the South African variant is, is resistance to vaccines, then it's not going to make any difference. The truth is um, I listened to the, I can't remember the lady's name, so I apologize in advance, but the very, very uh, wonderful professor at Oxford that's, that invented the Oxford um, AstraZeneca vaccine. And she was very clear about this virus. And that was that all vaccines will, will have an impact no matter how much it mutates. Again, if we just listen to all the fear and all the peddled fear by the scientists, then we'll never come out of a lockdown and we'll never go back to normal. And all the conspiracy theorists will be celebrating in the streets. Um, quite frankly, um, Ian, you know, you can't, just and, and, and also the hypocrisy of 34 countries when we know there's at least another 60 or more countries that have the South African variant because it's all over the place. Just like the Kemp variant and the this variant and the that variant and there'll be another thousand variants over the years. We have got to learn to live with the disease. The vaccines at the very least will, will as, as, as the lady said, the vaccines at the very least will stop death in most cases and stave off severe or critical illness. I've got to listen to someone that, that knows what they're talking about, just like people should listen to professionals in business when they know what they're talking about. Um, you cannot, it's too late now, it's too far gone. You either end up like Australia and New Zealand, who in a year's time will still be in some kind of major lock, not locked down, but locked away from the rest of the world, um, or you have to adapt and accept where you're at, work with the data, as we've said several times in this interview, but move forward because there are other consequences, not just, not just a virus that kills 0.25 to 0.3% of the people that catch it. There are other consequences here and economies have been very badly damaged. Um, people's lives have been very badly damaged and it all it all has to be taken into account. Coronavirus is not the only thing people die from. Okay, okay. That, uh, that's uh, uh, undoubtedly uh, true or the world would be very overcrowded. Um, I wanted to ask you uh, about the, what you think the industry needs to see from the Chancellor on March the 3rd in the, in the budget. Now, given that it's clear that travel and hospitality is going to be restricted for some months, probably yet, although my own feeling is there will be an opening by the summer, by July for international travel. So um, firstly, um, I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I, I feel that by July, um, the numbers will allow travel to open up. Uh, maybe not not to the whole world, but certainly not to Australia and New Zealand. But but travel will open up. Uh, so I do agree with you on that. Uh, as for the Chancellor, um, you you may or may not be aware, Ian, but the Chancellor has already today talked about extending furlough uh, to 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 July, I believe. Uh, I call that kicking the can down the road. Um, I think furlough has been helpful for industries that have been unable to um, operate uh, uh, fully, uh, like, like our own business. You know, we've had to follow people. It's helped save the business. But equally, we've had to keep people like yourself working in. Um, and, and, you know, you've done a sterling job. You know, the editorial teams at, at TW 
group have done an amazing job, both on the hospitality and travel side. Um, but we're not making money, but we're paying you money. So the furlough scheme has helped, has helped. Uh, but what, what again upsets me is it's not a one size fits all. There have been numerous businesses that have been taking uh, advantage of that furlough scheme and, and robbing the taxpayers blind. And then of course, again, then the taxpayers get cross and then they don't realize that there are industries that are in genu genuine need of support and in the industries that are taking liberties. I've kept my language good in case there will be any youngsters watching. So that, that's the issue here. Again, you know, the government needs to redirect resources into travel and hospitality and other industries that have been disproportionately, and that's the word, disproportionately affected by this crisis. Not scattergun approach, but again, governments worry about what people think. So they just spread it all around. And instead of actually helping, it's not. Because the travel industry now is going to need a lot of support. The hospitality industry is going to need a lot of support. There will be a lot of people unemployed when furlough ends because unfortunately a lot of businesses are not going to bounce back. There will be pent up demand for travel. We can all see it. You know that I own businesses in North America and the amount of advanced bookings for 22, 23 and even late 2021 20, are enormous. There's huge pent up demand, but unfortunately people have lost their jobs people that are, that are on furlough will not all come back into their jobs and and i believe that the government uh, they won't but richie sunak if he actually listened to people that understand and if if they listen to people that run small to medium sized businesses rather than celebrities or big business leaders let's be honest again here i'm going to upset a few people but i'm prepared to do it you know, the backbone of any economy is the small and medium sized businesses. And they're the people that have to work a darn sight harder to stay in business than the big companies because the big companies operate under their own inertia largely. And also the big companies can borrow money because when you've borrowed a few billion, it's the bank's problem. And when you've borrowed a few million, it's your problem. So the big companies will get through this the smaller companies, will, which actually make up the backbone of, of any economy in, in, in a capitalist democracy, are the ones that are never listened to. And it makes my blood boil because what they do again is, and I'm not going to name names, but, uh, but in hospitality, you know, they'll interview celebrities. Uh, Richie Sunak spoke to a celebrity chef. You know, with, with respect, the man lives in Los Angeles in a gilded cage He's made his fortune from TV, not from his, his businesses. Speak to people at the coalface. Speak to people that know. Speak to people that are fighting day in and day out, not just to support their employees that have got their own problems, that are living alone, that have got parents that are sick, etc., or that are trying to survive. Speak to people that are actually at the coalface. Don't speak to people to virtue signal and show off about that you're doing something when you're not so okay. the answer is don't expect anything much from richie sunak but the truth is if they directed um resources at travel hospitality and affected industries and spoke to small business owners when i say small i don't mean necessarily you know just one or two employees but i mean smaller businesses that make up the backbone of the economy they'd get a far greater insight and they will be able to be far more helpful, but they don't and they won't. Okay. We're going to have to get somebody from the department of business on with you another time. And then we can put some of those uh, issues to, to them to, to respond. And if indeed they do speak to uh, smaller businesses and, and so on, Clive, I'm, a, I'm conscious of the time and we need to wind up, but essentially what you're saying is, we need targeted support, targeted relief, uh, furlough to continue longer for those sectors that can't restart to retain staff and so on, to get money in and all the, all the rest of it, presumably help with um, extension of loan repayments and, and, and all the rest of it. Um, so 
hopefully we'll get some of, of, of that. Tell me to, to finish how you see the immediate future for travel and hospitality, let's say through till the autumn and how you, th how you see the, the following two to three years. I think th there's been an impact on consumer confidence because of, of, of all the things we've discussed earlier, so I won't go back on them. Having said that though, there is, there is enormous pent up demand. We live in a world where people, people's leisure time represents a much greater proportion of their overall time than it did 30, 40, 50 years ago. Uh, people have become accustomed to eating out, going to pubs uh, and taking breaks, both short breaks, uh, traveling abroad, and as I said earlier, we mustn't forget that people have families abroad, relatives. So the travel industry will bounce back, um, but the damage that's been done to the industry, and the point I made earlier, mustn't be overlooked. The bigger companies have been saddled with enormous amounts of debt, or they've highly diluted their, their, their paper, their shares, to raise money to stay in business. The, the consequence is going to be that the cost of traveling is going to go up by quite a bit because there is an enormous amount of debt that's gonna to have to be paid back. Smaller businesses, again, have, have had to take on debt. Uh, businesses that have never had debt, you know, I'll be honest on, on, on here, you know, we, we've never had any debt in our business ever but I had to take a, a government backed uh, loan to ensure uh, and make sure that the, 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 that the business was safe and secure. You know, and, and debt needs to be paid back. So, so there's no doubt that travel will bounce back uh, and it will take time for people to regain their confidence, but the cost of traveling is, is, is probably, was probably at peak, at peak minimum um, um, in, in March 2019 before this crisis um, because there's an awful lot of debt that's going to have to be paid back. Okay, and presumably uh, when things restart, the likes of Ryanair will make cheap fares available and so on. So the impact on pricing won't be immediately uh, uh, clear because we'll see all sorts of uh, bargains other than for peak times when people want to go away. But how do you see this this working through then that there'll be company failures, uh, reduction in supply and so on and and so you will see these price increases work through in the following in following years? So my, my overall view is that first and foremost um, you know, there, there will be an impact at the bottom end of the market because people have lost their jobs. Uh, people, people, a lot of people have suffered. The flip side is that a lot of people um, money, so you've got people that have got money to spend as well. So there'll definitely be uh, a, a short-term party, uh, honeymoon period, uh, but we all know what happens when you have a good party. Um, it's not that good unless you go home with a sore head. And I think there's going to be a big hangover uh, because structurally um, what's happened to the economies of, of certainly of the Western economies, structurally they are very, very damaged. And, you know, you've got countries that are saddled with, with debt that are going to have to raise taxes or find ways of paying off the debt. There's the ever present risk of inflation where we were at zero interest rates. There are, there are many, threats on the horizon. And the danger is that people get sucked into a full sense of security in that period where people are euphoric and, and actually feeling freedom again. When, 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 the, when, when the party is over, um, there is going to be some reckoning and there will be failures. Uh, unemployment is going to unquestionably grow. Um, we, we, we mustn't lose sight of the threat of artificial intelligence. And, and increased automation as a threat to jobs anyway. Um, so there are, you know, the, the world has many, many, many hurdles to overcome. The travel industry has been incredibly resilient no matter what crises have been thrown at it. Um, and I, I do believe it will uh, rebound. 
but I do think it's going to uh, look differently when the dust settles and it's going to have to reflect. You mentioned earlier a certain airline offering um, very cheap fares. I've, I've got to be honest with you, it's, you know, that, that is the exception uh, as opposed to the rule. We know that business has been a very successful business. Um, it doesn't carry um, debt like a lot of its competitors. Um, the reality is for most businesses, it's going to take a lot of time to, to rebuild and also the additional cost of measures and rules and regulations and bureaucracy that will come into play to, to further protect people, uh, quite rightly, but it all costs money and it's all gonna have an impact. Okay, we, we could uh, explore this area further, but let's leave it for another time. Clive, thank you. Thank you, Ian.